This week's number, $667 million. That's how much Chelsea FC spent on new players this season, more than every team in the Spanish league combined. What do you say to a Chelsea fan who's got a hot-looking woman in his arm? Nice tattoo. Literally, that's the best they could do for me. Welcome to Prof G Markets. Today, we're discussing the market's renewed love for Meta, ChatGPT's second-order effects, SoFi's turnaround, and the latest from the Adani Group saga. Here with the news is Prof G media analyst and Chelsea fan, Ed Elson. Ed, how are you? So, Scott, last week we were talking about how to make this show more freaky because, as you said, we need to go places that CNBC can't. Um, We got a lot of great suggestions from listeners, but I wanted to read you this one, which I thought was especially good. If we want to do, if you want to do something CNBC won't do, you've got six months to plan it. Do a Burning Man episode. Hmm. (laughs) What are your thoughts on a company offsite at Burning Man this year? Is that freaky enough for you? So this sounds like you couching a boondoggle (laughs) in innovation. Am I accurate here? (laughs) Let no, me guess. No, the next, the next freaky thing we could do company. is go to Cannes. But... <laughs> yeah, you, we could get freaky in Saint Tropez. How's that? You you want us all to go to Burning Man? No, no <laughs> one, no one that works for me needs to see me at Burning Man. <laughs> so actually, if I go to Burning Man, there's no chance any of you are going. I will pay you not to go if I'm there. So yeah, I, I don't. Would you I, ever go? You know, every year I plan to go to Burning Man. I think it's one of those things that's on my bucket list. And every year it comes at a weird time. And I think my window is closing. I don't, I'm at, like, I think about this a lot. And I want to stay in one of those douchebag camps with chefs and Russian hookers. But I I have no desire to have the full Burning Man sandstorm, uncomfortable sleep in a yurt kind of thing. That's just not, that's just where I am, uh, not where I am with my life. So anyways, if you hear about. Let's do the the Russian hooker one, but. Bring your whole company along. There you go. Yeah, that that spells that spells uh, uh, n- n- no lawsuits and, and labor <laughs> law. Yeah. Anyways, anyways, so one of us one of us is going to Burning Man, Ed. By the way, where where are you right now? You've got a weird background. I'm at the Faina Hotel. It's very fancy here. I like it a lot. I'm in the biggest city in Latin America, Miami, and uh, I'm holed up in a hotel. Uh, it's beautiful out, but instead, I'm here with you at a pair of headphones in a temperature controlled room so i'm really excited to be here with you and anyway speaking of that the sand the beaches the beaches await the dog get right to the news what's going on okay let's start with our weekly review of market vitals the s p 500 hit its highest level in five months the dollar fell on news from the federal reserve bitcoin climbed as high as twenty four thousand dollars, and the yield on 10-year treasuries fell Shifting to the headlines. Last week, we discussed Chevron's massive share repurchasing program, and the company went on to report record annual profits of $36 billion. Well, Exxon just eclipsed that report. It posted its own record of $56 billion for 2022. The Federal Reserve raised interest rates by 25 basis points, as expected. Fed Chair Jerome Powell indicated another hike next month is likely, and he pointed to the fact that the labor market is still hot. U.S. job openings hit a five-month high of 11 million for December. Meanwhile, the European Central Bank and the Bank of England both raised interest rates by 50 basis points. And finally, last week marked the third anniversary of Brexit. According to Bloomberg Economics, Brexit has cost the U.K., £100 billion per year, or almost $375 billion since the split. If the UK had stayed in the EU, Britain's economy would be 4% larger. Scott, you've been in London for about five months now. What are your thoughts on this? I think there's few people that have done more damage to the UK in history than uh, Nigel Farage. Farage, what's his name? The Brexit guy? Yeah who was claiming it was going to be their Independence Day. And the question is exactly who was Britain getting independence from? Other nations get independence from Britain, not vice versa. But if you think about uh, the UK, fantastic education institutions, great culture. Every wealthy person in the world has homes in one of two places, either New York or London. 
It's got, um, it's the jumping off point for the rest of Europe. It's kind of the safe haven to do business. It's, you know, you can look at it as either the world's largest uh, money washing company or a great place, a safe haven for wealth. Anyone with a lot of money comes to London and they basically say in London because of private property laws that we don't care how you made your money overseas, who died, who was exploited, what corruption got you that money. And I'm not suggesting that anyone that moves to London is doing that. But the result is there's just a massive amount of capital that has inflowed into London and huge industries are propped up around that, banking and services. So they've got everything kind of going for them, uh, except they always manage to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. And in this case, Brexit, it's like, well, how could we increase our costs for our own citizens? Well, let's limit immigration and limit talent, you know, the kind of the Polish plumber or the trope of a Polish plumber. And let's also reduce our access to the European continent in terms of the products we sell. So we're going to reduce demand for our products, but we're going to increase the cost of our products. It just doesn't make any goddamn sense. And I, I would argue that in the U.S., the thing that's harder to wrap your head around because it makes absolutely no sense is guns. And these aren't analogous. But mm -hmm. the thing I just can't figure out in the United Kingdom is how they decided or what logic around uh, Brexit. It's like, you know what? We just, we just, this whole prosperity thing, we don't like it and we're going to, we're going to do away with it. So, yeah, I don't, I, t I hundred percent still haven't figured out how this happened or why they don't repeal it. You're British. What's your insight here? Well, I haven't been in Britain for eight or nine years you have the accent which means you have credibility <laughs> here what's going on well what i remember from when brexit happened and when farage was on a tear was his big his big shtick was that europeans are coming in and stealing all of our manufacturing basically and it's specifically the big thing you would talk about is that the spanish are coming in and they're taking our fish that we have all of these great fisheries around the coast and we need to basically divorce ourselves from the EU because they're coming in and stealing all of our, basically just stealing our fish. And that was the thing that really riled people up. Um, and he started a movement because of it. And then, you know, the thing that I learned from Brexit is that you just cannot have direct referendums on policies that are just going to completely change the economic trajectory of, the, of your country. And that's what they did. They said, OK, well, we're going to have to ask the public about this at some point. So let's just do it. And they didn't think about the fact that, OK, they actually might vote yes on this thing. Um, and it put them in a hole. And now they, had, they can't pull back from it because they don't want to look stupid. So it's just the perfect example of the dangers of direct democracy, which I'm sure that I will get shit for saying that. But... The reality is we have representative democracies for a reason. We don't vote directly on massively impactful uh, economic decisions. We leave that to our representatives who have experts who recommend the best solution moving forward. But they said, fuck it. Let's just ask everyone if we want to leave the European Union. And of course, Farage riles everyone up and they say, yeah, let's let's do it. We're down. Um, it's, it's an interesting <laughs> point. And it sounds even more intelligent to see above British accent. But <laughs> you're right. We have a representative or elected government that's supposed to slow things down and think about them. And then, and who really fucked up here, who played poker and lost big time for the British people was David Cameron. Yeah. yeah. Who thought, oh, let's put this to bed. I'll just do a, you know, I'll allow a referendum and let people vote. And they showed him. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, any, I think any sort of slow down or a thoughtful commentary at, you know, whatever they call it, Monday's lunch or wherever they stand up. What's that called? PM's questions? PM's questions, yeah. yeah. I just think this thing would have died yeah. in committees. They just, too many lobbyists would have said, wait, you're going to kick us in the nuts? And, you know, I don't care if you're Rolls Royce or Burberry. They just would have said, you realize how bad this is going to be for us, right? Mm -hmm. I think even the unions probably would have backed off of this. But anyways, it it is a great point. The reason we don't vote by phone on everything is we elect people who are supposed to slow things down and say, okay, let's really think this through. Mm -hmm. And even, you know, there's, there's so many bad things about our elected democracy, specifically gerrymandering and how money, you know, kind of washes over Washington. Uh, but it is true that there's a reason 
we have a buffer yeah. in between the populace and you know kind of what you call real time democracy that people yeah. in some it's just remarkable how stupid people are yeah. um and you want to at least try to incorporate a wisdom of crowds and that uh, in every democracy is kind of elected representatives who are supposed to slow things down and yeah. think about it but yeah i just i just um yeah i don't and the founding it. fathers knew that you know like this was the whole point of a republic and then whenever you say anything like this people think that you're being communists or anti-patriotic but it's like the entire constitution of the U.S. is built on this concept that we want to hear, the, get the people's voice, but also let's slow it down and let's filter it and let's not let one or two, you know, fits of emotion decide the trajectory of the country. So just some other thoughts. Yes. Yeah, um, you know, the record profits of the oil companies. If, yep. if the profits are a function of monopoly abuse, they should be broken up. You know, profits of this enormity, um, I don't know what the construct or the complexion of the bailouts were, but it absolutely makes no sense that companies like this, my understanding is they got bailouts. What I don't like is that um, Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm told CNN that big oil is prioritizing profits for their shareholders over helping the citizens. Well, guess what? That's oh, called shit. a private company, Secretary Granholm. And basically every company does that. And that's what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to be the engine room uh, that creates profits that then get taxed that you can then prioritize social services and our defense department and, and welfare and Medicare, et cetera. But this chastising or this attempt to shame companies for being as profitable as possible is just so, mm -hmm. it kind of positions us as Democrats as not getting it. I hate mm -hmm. that stuff. It's like, okay, if they're getting, if they're extracting unfair profits because of monopoly abuse and break them up, if they're not paying their fair share of taxes, I get it. But accusing them of prioritizing profits, yeah, okay said said well done or you know well done said every shareholder the other thing that i thought was really interesting was the fed raising rates by just 25 bips i think that the markets uh, at least in tech stocks the ones that are more sensitive to interest rates are ripping today because people see a light at the end of the tunnel of this more hawkish fed policy and people are now even saying that they might uh, they can see their path to the fed bringing down rates at the end of this year early uh, 24. I think that's really interesting. I think it's. I think we could be on the cusp of a pretty dramatic tick up in growth stocks again, and we've already seen it. They've already started their recovery. It'll be interesting to see how long it lasts, but it looks like um, we're creating sort of the perfect storm of good things, excuse to cut costs, per perhaps interest rates coming down at some point, inflation mm -hmm. coming down. But uh, the consumer price index declined 0.1% in December and is up 6.5% from a year ago which is high historically, but that's down from the peak of 9% last summer. So yeah. inflation is off 250 bips from its high. Uh, what's really fascinating is there's a huge perception or a gap between how the economy is actually doing uh, and the real data or how people think the economy is doing and how it's actually doing. Recent economic data has been really positive. Inflation over the past six months was less than 2%. At an annual rate, real GDP has increased almost 7%, 6.7% under Biden. And America's gained 4.5 million jobs, or America gained 4.5 million jobs in 2022. But still, most Americans feel pessimistic about the economy in early December, an Associated Press poll. Uh, so three quarters of Americans describe the economy as poor. It's so interesting. I'm fascinated with the idea of the cadence of news. And that is, you could have... A booming economy, uh, you know, opioid addiction eliminated and, you know, champagne and cocaine dropped off at every household and people would find a reason to say why the world and the U.S. and everyone else sucks. Overspending, yeah. <laughs> and I think it's a function of um, the cadence of media. And what do I mean by that? If you, if the media was forced to have just one headline for the last century, that headline, if they just had to pick one headline to summarize the last hundred years in the West, it would probably be something along the lines of uh, the West or Democratic allies repel uh, tyranny. You know, they push back Hitler. If they could only have one headline for the last 50 years, and it's a fun exercise to go through, I would pick um, the headline would be historic, unprecedented prosperity led by America and China. But because the cadence of media is CNN and Fox have to capture attention every 15, 30, 60 minutes, 
They know the only way to maintain your attention is to catastrophize and to see everything in a negative light. So we have put out a bunch of posts recently. Some are very positive about inflation coming down, about the opportunities of AI. Why is Dr. Phil and Michael Smirkanish asked us to come on their show? Because we're talking about population decline and a bunch of people got angry. You know, like that's what will get viewers, right? And it, it, it just everywhere you see this, the, the worst headline in the world, and the reason it's never a headline, is things marginally better today. That is never a headline. And it's interesting because I'm a glass half empty kind of guy, but I just don't think if you really take a sober look at the data, I don't think you could ignore that things are beginning to actually look pretty good. I'm also, and I'll stop my rant, I'm 100% convinced now, that's not true, 80, 90% convinced, we're not going to have a deep recession because, oh, wow. okay. and I don't know what the psychology is or the phenomena is called. I'm sure there is. It has been named. But if you worry about something long enough, it doesn't happen. That's been my experience. Remember how worried we were about Greek sovereign debt infecting all of the European economy? It's the things you're not worried about that get you. No one except Bill Gates and maybe Fauci was worried about a pandemic killing a million Americans. That just wasn't something we were thinking a lot about. We have been talking and worrying and having indigestion over this impending recession for what feels like about two years now. And I'm convinced that, and it, I guess it makes sense, the shit you're worried about, you prepare for. And as a function of that, it's less likely to happen. But I'm now convinced, based on the economic data I'm seeing, that we're likely not going to see much of a recession. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the soft landing looks like it's happening. Okay, let's move on to our first story. Meta, whose stock got crushed last year, missed its earnings, but the market loved it. The company brought in $32 billion in revenue, down 4% from a year ago, but still higher than Wall Street's estimates of $31.5 billion. But earnings per share came in at $1.76. That's 50 cents below market expectations. Yet the company's stock was up more than 20%. So what got the market so excited? Well, Mark Zuckerberg said in the earnings call that 2023 would be the, quote, year of efficiency, which the market took to be a hint at further layoffs. The company also promised to reduce capital expenditures from $37 billion to $30 billion. And finally, Facebook reached the golden number. The social media platform now has 2 billion daily active users. So, Scott, I think this deserves at least a partial victory lap. In November, you said that the best performing large tech stock of 2023 would be Airbnb, Chinese tech stocks, and also Meta. Could you explain your thesis there and also your general reaction to these earnings? Uh, Meta became oversold. And it was obvious or seemed fairly obvious to me that the moment that Mark Zuckerberg woke up from this fever dream, ayahuasca-induced hallucination of the metaverse, that the billion dollars a month they were wasting on the metaverse would immediately flow to the bottom line. And that's the word that sent the stock up. I think it's up like 25% today. It will be one of the biggest one-day gains, I think, in history yeah. for a tech company. 52% year to date. <laughs> and since we made the prediction in November, the stock's up 50%. And I hate this company. So I'm proud of this prediction because I'd like to think we call it balls and strikes. The company was oversold. And we said the moment... He takes the cash from the cash volcano that is their core business and stops pissing it away or immolating it on the metaverse. It all flows to the bottom line. And all he had to say was that we're reducing capital expenditures from $37 billion to $30 billion. And everyone said, okay, that must mean he's waking up. The anesthesiologist is bringing him to, and he's going to stop spending so much on the metaverse. And the stock just ripped up. There was also some other things that just highlight the power of this company. Uh, as you referenced, over 2 billion daily active users. Uh, TikTok might pass that, I think, in the next couple of years. But for now, uh, Meta or Facebook or Instagram is really the unprecedented, most successful product in history. There is no religion, you know, economic system, TV show, reality show, whatever you want to call it, product that gets 2 billion daily active users. Nothing. Also, there's some really fascinating tidbits from the earnings call. Air France is now using WhatsApp as its primary means of customer service and, and communication, which just gives you a sense of the potential 
that for WhatsApp. I mean, WhatsApp could be the biggest global telco company or whatever, or maybe that moves to AI and customer service, but the, the power that could be unleashed there at some point. And right now that potential is fallow from an economic standpoint. They're not charging, but it is, it is striking. And even things like Reels was up, I think, 20%. I yeah. find myself, I don't know about you, Ed, I'm watching Reels more, not, because, <laughs> yeah. not because it's better. When I take the time to exit out of the Instagram app and and tap on the TikTok app, I immediately register a better experience. I'm like, oh, these vet videos are better. There's a deeper well of content and creators. The algorithm is clearly better to, to curate what I want. But I still find myself on Reels a lot because I am right there. Yep. When I look at my Instagram feed to see what other people are saying and specifically what people are saying about my content because I'm desperate for other people's affirmation, <laughs> You click on the top on that little circle and it's lit up and you see you start seeing reels. Yeah. So it's kind of the power of a captive audience. But the market just loved the fact that he appears to be uh, uh, stirring from this, you know, meth induced coma uh, or, you know, whatever you want to call it, that, that mm -hmm. the, the drug is running out and he's sobering up around the metaverse and also people just said, look, this thing's been oversold. But there's just no doubt about it. Um, this was. This was an enormous uh, report yeah. uh, for Meta. And then the combination of it looks like inflation might be abating, interest rates might be coming down. It's like the perfect storm of good things mm -hmm. for growth for the growth sector right now. Yeah. Yeah. So they lost $14 billion in, on the Metaverse last year, um, specifically on their Reality Labs group. Um, and I think the big question that everyone had is, are you going to keep pushing for this ridiculous metaverse dream. Um, and Zuckerberg didn't really mention that at all in the call. And then finally, towards the end of the earnings call, one analyst asked if we should expect increased losses on Reality Labs in 2023. Um, the CFO, Susan Lee, responded to that question. She said, quote, we still expect our Reality Labs losses to increase in 2023. And then something that Zuckerberg said, he said, quote, none of the signals that I've seen so far suggest that we should shift the Reality Lab strategy long term. We are constantly adjusting the specifics of how we execute this. So to me, it's like he's almost signaling, OK, we're going to bring down the capex. It's the year of efficiency. We're going to pare down losses. But in terms of what, the, what they're actually going to do about the metaverse dream, I'm not sure that that they're walking the talk here. If they're still just quietly saying, we, you know, we might increase the reality lab spend. Do you, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? There's a few things here, and some of them are sort of a a life lesson. I do think the market, I think they carefully curated that word efficiencies. Uh -huh. And I think they're signaling that this might be coming to an end, or they at least might be reducing that spend, or they're going to look for reductions in spend elsewhere. And I hate to admit it, but Elon Musk has provided cloud cover for every company to start reducing its expenses specifically, which is Latin for fire people. And they've shoved so many calories down the esophagus of these companies that there's fat deposits everywhere. So everyone's like, okay, what if, what if they laid off a third of their staff? What would that mean for profits? And also when they use the word efficiency, they do believe that this is, the spending is at least going to come down. $14 billion on Reality Labs over the course of a year, if they took all of that capital and said, okay, it's literally meaningless, which it is. It's a total waste of money, which okay. it is. And they put it all to the bottom line. $14 billion in profits, annual profits, just those profits would make Meta one of the most profitable companies in the world. That's the <laughs> level of spend and waste here. Yeah. The other thing to keep in mind is, and this is more of a life lesson, success is the best thing. The next best thing is quick failure. Mm -hmm. And I hate meta. And I would actually like to see, I think it's bad for the world, bad for Commonwealth, especially bad for teen girls. And I think it's run by a sociopath who's immature and has no sense or grasp of his power or his impact on the world. Anyways, enough of that. <laughs> the best thing that could happen if you want this company to go down in flames or severely be diminished in terms of its economic power and clout would be that there's some more signs of success with the metaverse. Yep. Because here's the thing, the second best thing is quick failure. And the metrics here are so terrible. This is so obviously a stupid strategy that, has, that is not working 
that I do think by the end of this year, they're going to go, okay, enough already. I mean, this has just gotten kind of ridiculous. Mm -hmm. The worst thing that can happen to you, I started an e-commerce incubator in 2000. I raised money in December of 99, literally as the market was peaking. I raised $15 million at a pre-money valuation of $35 million. So a company that was going to have me, I was the only employee, and a 14-slide PowerPoint deck was worth $35 million at that moment. And I was going to punch out e-commerce companies in New York. I was backed by Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, uh, Maveron, a great VC out of Seattle, Howard Schultz's VC, and a bunch of, like a bevy of wealthy kind of icons of business. When the market imploded around dot-com in March of 2000, it was like, okay, this shit, this dog isn't going to hunt. There's no market to fund e-commerce startups right now. The idea of an incubator, whether it was Idea Labs or ICG or all these different like B2B incubators was not working. And I literally unplugged the thing six months later and gave the remaining capital back to investors and told the portfolio companies we'd started three companies. I shut one down and said to the other two, cut your costs by 50%. We'll invest a little bit more money. You need two years to get through the winter. That was in my opinion, sort of a success because we failed fast. The worst thing that can happen to you, the worst thing that can happen to you is you fail slowly. Uh, I started Red Envelope in 1997 and there was always signs of potential and success. Fast growth, easy to raise cheap capital, NASDAQ IPO in 2002, always some signs of success, always trouble, never really had a strong economic model, shit show of management, Interesting warfare or fratricine warfare, I don't know what the term interesting, I guess, warfare at the board level. I mean, just all the shit that was hitting this company every day. And then 2008 comes 11 years later, credit crisis, our letter of credit, or our credit line gets pulled, longshoreman strike in the port of Long Beach, all our Christmas merchandise held offshore, the guns spitting out the labels at the Kentucky-Ohio border fulfillment facility start sending gifts to the wrong addresses. Boom, we are out of business in nine weeks. That's bad, but what was profoundly fucked up was it took me 11 years to fail. That is the worst professional experience I've had, not because of the failure, but because it was an 11-year failure. Yeah. And so I am hoping, and I wanna, I wanna encourage everybody to buy an Oculus and to go on their <laughs> social media platforms and say how much they love Horizons World or whatever it's called, because I would like a little bit of success here to create a massive failure Mm -hmm. for meta because the reality is if the metrics continue to be this awful they're going to have the second best thing and that is they're going to fail fast mm -hmm. yeah i mean he's in a different position though to you because i mean he's in so deep here he's a public company ceo two billion users on his biggest platform and he literally changed the name to the new strategy so i mean i'm just thinking about perceived value here I wonder if it actually makes sense to put it to bed sort of slowly, sort of quietly, hedge his bets as opposed to say, oh, yeah, wait, my bad. We should have just been Facebook. Meta was stupid and I'm an idiot. You know, that could be, be even worse for the stock. You're exactly right. He can he can turn chicken shit into chicken salad here and that we have such progress because of the good work in Reality Labs around video gaming. We're going to focus here. And the great thing about video games is it won't require the same level of expenditure. He'll come up with a bunch of reasons to take that $14 billion down to seven, five, and then ultimately one or $2 billion. And mm -hmm. maybe there is something that actually makes sense here. But it, it it's just, uh, unfortunately for people like me who ate meta, the data is too obviously clear that this isn't working. Um, but I, they'll come up with a ton of reasons why they're you know, scaling back and try and position it as a victory. Basically, the term efficiencies added, the word efficiencies added somewhere between 30 and $50 billion of market cap to this company this morning. Okay, final question. Will you buy any Meta stock? No, I, I used to own Facebook and I sold it because a lot of people, I've always been, tried to be pretty transparent about my stock holdings. And a lot of people said, it's pretty hypocritical for you to be so critical of this company and say that it's bad for kids and yet you own the stock. And I think there's some truth to that. I'm a capitalist. I would buy Chevron stock. You know, I'm, I believe in climate change. I don't think these companies are good for the world, but, um, you know, I'm mostly focused on my, me and my own family's economic security. Uh, and, uh, you know, if it's a publicly traded company and they're not doing anything illegal, I'll own the stock. But it got to the point with Meta where it did feel just uncomfortable to be saying, you know, to be raising alarm and just feeling so bad about the company that owned the stock. So I sold the stock about, 
three or four years ago. It ended up being a good move. I think Great I sold move, it at yeah. 160 <laughs> or 180. And it went down to wherever it, it went up to like 300, then down to 90. And now it's back to 160 or 180. But mm-hmm. no, I don't. I don't own it. And I don't think I'll ever own it. Okay, let's move on to our second story. OpenAI, the company behind the text generating AI bot ChatGPT, launched a pilot subscription plan called ChatGPT+. Plus. The premium plan starts at $20 a month and offers faster response times and priority access during peak hours. It feels like ChatGPT just can't stay out of the headlines right now. This is all coming right after the news that BuzzFeed will start using OpenAI to generate its own content. And BuzzFeed's stock popped more than 300% after that announcement. So, Scott, the market clearly loves AI. Do you think the market is reacting rationally to this technology? Well, no. The markets are typically irrational in the short term, but over the long term get increasingly rational. And uh, effectively what you have is, and Bruce Buchanan, an economist at the Stern School, a colleague, he has uh, a theory or he has a construct that has sort of changed the way I look at business or distilled all business down to something very basic. And that is all business comes down to three lines. The bottom line is your costs, right? The cost of producing a product, the human capital, the factory, et cetera, plant, property, equipment. And then the middle line is the price you charge for that service or product. And then the third line at the top is the perceived value of that product. Now, there's only two ways to add shareholder value. You either bring the cost line down or you take perceived value up. So far, ChatGPT has created excitement around the bottom line moving. It's not saying, oh, great, BuzzFeed is going to be able to use AI to create more interesting articles, a greater breadth of articles that offer real insight, better reading, none of that. It's not about pushing the top line up. It's about bringing costs down. There's a general belief, I believe, that the market senses that they will be able to lay off 20, 40, 60 percent of their editors, journalists, and tech staff using AI while holding on to the majority of revenues because they'll be able to produce a reasonable facsimile of the content they produce on dramatically less resources, which will massively bring down their costs, thereby creating much greater margins. In sum, if they can take their SGNA, their costs down 20 or 30% without any tangible um, effect on the core product, they should become much more profitable. When a new technology comes along, generally people are thinking about what impact it has on the bottom line. When I say the bottom line, the lowest line, the cost line. And then over time, there's new businesses that improve the perceived value. And that is, give us all of your health records, sign the forms here, we're going to feed them into an AI algorithm, and we're going to come back with a series of predictions around, um, and that's what AI is at the end of the day, a prediction machine around future health risks and what you should do right now to intervene and potentially stave off these health risks, whether it's diabetes or Alzheimer's, what have you. That would be a perceived value being pushed up, new business. Whenever there's a new technology, they focus on the bottom line going down, the cost line going down, but over time, innovators and people start thinking, well, how could we increase the perceived value of this product? And right now, the companies that are going kind of crazy are mostly pushing the line down. An example of how AI is pushing the perceived value line up to add shareholder value Right now, the perceived value of Bing, based on the incremental value that AI or OpenAI might add to Bing, is improving the perceived value of Microsoft's search offering. In the day they call it Bing by ChatGPT or AI Bing, market share of Bing is going to go from 6% to 20 or 30% because the perceived value, whether it makes a better search engine or not, TBD, will go up. So both things happen, but it's a useful construct. All stakeholder value is moving one or more of these lines. Could you ever see ChatGPT bringing costs down at ProfG Media? <laughs> yeah, actually, we'd like to speak to you after the show, Ed. Um, I don't know. I, I think we're because we're small enough, and I think, I mean, if the answer was yes, I'd lie to you. So, um, <laughs> yeah. But I think when I think of this, I think of it so immediately, that's a good question. All of us, every, every business owner is thinking, how do you use AI, or you should be thinking get this rid way, of my employees. <laughs> to either decrease costs, pull the price line down, excuse me, pull the cost line up, or increase perceived value. 
What I'm thinking about is how could we use chat, GPT, or AI to produce massively more content, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm not thinking about it, how does it replace humans? My sense is the people we have, we have all of these overeducated young people, will be better at coming up with new ways and new products as opposed to trying to figure out a way to reduce costs. So I immediately go to <laughs> how do I push the perceived value lineup? And some, how do we, could we produce just a ton of, you know, reasonably good content under the Prop G banner using chat GPT? Could 10 people, I forget what we have, 10 or 12 people, you all look the same to me at this point. Could we, in fact, produce as much as a 30 or 40 person company but I'm not looking to produce as much as we do now with six people. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes me feel good. So it seems like a lot of people are worried about their jobs. I've seen a ton of headlines about it, but how do they actually feel? Let's go to Mia on the street. Okay, so our first question is, could AI replace your job? Uh, yeah, I'm very concerned about that. Yes, it can. I hope so. I don't want to work anymore. The question is, will my boss know that AI is replacing my job? So you feel like it already is replacing your job? Some aspects. I use chat GPT quite frequently. And what is it that you do? Uh, I'm in venture capital. I do hair. So imagine the calamity <laughs> that could happen if you let a robot who thinks they know mm -hmm. do it. No. Definitely not. I think about it often. And I think that they're going to develop something and it's going to be not good it's gonna like cause a lot of tears when like myself who's in nonprofits and is doing grant reports and does seem like ai is encroaching more and more on that territory i do know that a lot of tech companies are fearful of ai so maybe it is smart enough and we're just too dumb to realize it hopefully not digital bank sofi reported fourth quarter earnings last week and it was a beat on all counts the company grew its revenue by 60% from a year ago to $450 million. That beat expectations by $27 million. It also narrowed its losses from $0.15 cents a share last year to just $0.05 cents a share. And the company expects to reach profitability by the end of 2023. So far, shares rose 12% on the news. Now, this is an interesting stock because last year, SoFi had a terrible track record. The company went public in January via a SPAC. And just a reminder, SPAC stands for Special Purpose Acquisition Company. It's where you raise public funds with a shell company, which then acquires a private company at a later date. And in this case, that was SoFi. And it's also a controversial way of going public because you're not subject to the same disclosures as a regular IPO. And you also don't need to raise money from big institutional investors. Plus, the sponsor of the SPAC gets a nice chunk of the company for raising the money and for closing the acquisition. Now, in this case, that sponsor was Chamath Palahapatiya. Chamath took many companies via SPAC over the past several years, and he's been heavily criticized for their underperformance. Last year, SoFi lost 80% of its value, and other companies in Chamath's SPAC portfolio include Virgin Galactic and Clover Health, which lost 75% and 80% respectively. So, Scott, SPACs have gotten a really bad name, but these are strong earnings from SoFi. So what do you make of this company? So it's, it's interesting because SPACs have become synonymous with a company that shouldn't have gone public and has underperformed. Uh, and Chamath isn't as much an operator now as he was a banker that figured out a classic company that he could take public and take fees on, regardless of whether the company was a good company to, you know, should be public or not, or had any sort of um, real prospects. I forgot, you left out one. There was a, his most recent one was an ADHD treatment software company that had these, I think, video games that supposedly helped um, kids with ADHD. And it literally lost something like 80 or 90% of its value in the first 30 days. But it would be, I think, irrational and unfair not to believe that there is some chicken salad amongst the chicken shit here. And that is, it's, it's just unlikely that every SPAC is a shit company. There's got to be something out there that will be enduring and will work. And this might be that company. Uh, the numbers were, look really strong. It's, it's got decent margins and it's growing, which means at some point they, ha they have illuminated the light at the end of the tunnel, meaning if they continue to grow the way they grow and maintain the current cost structure, they will become profitable. 
I mean, but to date, it's been, um, I mean, it's been okay. All I need to know about whether I get near the stock or specifically that I shouldn't get near the stock is that it's a SPAC, meaning stay the hell away. So this would be great for the SPAC market uh, to have a winner here. Um, but yeah, at some point, um, at some point, one of these or more of these companies will likely emerge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's just talk a little bit about the company itself. So personal loan originations are up 50% from a year earlier, 46% increase in total deposits. Uh, the bank portion of the business brought in $30 million in net, in net income on a gap basis. They're projecting gap profitability by the end of the year. I mean, this is super impressive. And three months ago, it felt like every progressive sort of digital forward consumer bank was going to get screwed just purely based on market conditions. But they've actually grown the business here. So what do you think so far is getting right? My guess is from the ground up, a new kind of bank, if you will, or financial services company or lending company has the benefit of not building in those legacy costs and as a mm -hmm. result can offer you know, products at a better price. That's my best guess as to what's going on here. Mm -hmm. And do you think that this will spell uh, good things for the SPAC market in general? I mean, we've seen, I, I, I don't know if there's even been any SPAC IPOs this year, uh, but it was a huge thing in 2021. Um, do you think that this will sort of change the SPAC market? Yeah, just one more thing about SoFi. They're trying to position themselves as sort of the AWS of fintech, and that is offer services around the loan process that other financial institutions can adopt and uh, make sense for them to outsource it to uh, SoFi. So they want to be, they're kind of stepping into the supplier side of fintechs, and that platform grew their revenue 62% year on year to $315 million, which is uh, really impressive. And their financial services grew 189% year on year to $167 million. Yeah, this will be big for the SPAC market. And that is, it'll convince more investors to kind of try and wade through the rubble and see if they can find other underappreciated SPACs that have been written off for debt. Have you invested in any SPACs? I haven't. Um, I just don't, um, I don't get most of these things. And I think I'm like most people, when I find out it's a SPAC, I just stay the hell away from it. So I don't, I'm one of those people that just immediately sees SPAC anywhere near a company and thinks, stay, stay the hell away. Uh, Long-winded way of saying, no, I don't own any SPACs. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's move on to our final story. Last week, we mentioned a short seller report from Hindenburg Research that accused the Indian conglomerate Adani Group of engaging in, quote, brazen stock manipulation and accounting fraud over the course of decades. Here are some updates on that story. Since the report came out, Adani stock has fallen 40%, and last week it only got worse. Adani Group was in the process of completing a $2.4 billion equity sale to a group of institutional investors, and on Wednesday, the transaction was cancelled. In just a few hours after that news, the stock fell by nearly 30%. And to add some more context here, Adani Group is run by Gautam Adani, who was, until a few days ago, the third richest man in the world. The company operates multiple different businesses, including airports, port management, food processing, and renewable energy. But the majority of Adani Group's revenue comes from coal. So, Scott, there is a lot to unpack here. Where do you want to start? I think the most interesting thing is this new class of what I'll call investigative investing. And that is like investigative journalism, long-form journalism, where you really look at, okay, this guy named George Santos has lied about everything. <laughs> and it makes for just compelling reading. And you have journalists who have been funded and motivated to try and find interesting stories where they, they do a lot of gumshoe reporting and they're on the ground. And now there's this new category, and it's been around for a little while, of investigative uh, investing. And the work here is really substantial. They've made a mm -hmm. big investment in trying to understand all of these shell companies and all these subsidiaries and what was an arms length transaction and whether there was corruption and entities that looked like as if they were just they just existed to pump the stock. There was accusation of trying to intimidate journalists who were questioning the value of this. Yeah. So this is a new class. I just think everyone is so, including myself, so just blown away and impressed by Hindenburg <laughs> that they mm -hmm. find this thing, they say something's wrong in Mudville or something stinks. They start digging. And they just do an, an unbelievable job 
of uh, investigative reporting. But in the context of this thing is massively overvalued. And then they make a shit ton of money investing against the stock. Now, that makes them biased. But if you read the deck, it looks like they've done their work. I mean, they have really backed it up. Uh, the other thing is I think that the Indian market um, really suffers from this. I think this casts a real pall over the Indian system, if you will. And that is there is a lot of data that shows key to prosperity or economic growth, if you will, is trust. Now, what do we mean by that? Uh, countries that have rule of law, institutions, a regulatory framework, such that if you invest in a company and they end up being criminals, there's some recourse, or that there's some disclosure requirements or standards such that it's less likely there's going to be corruption and you're going to wake up one morning and have a really bad surprise. Mm -hmm. And this, this, no doubt about it, it, the market cap lost by Adani is dramatic, but the market cap loss that's much greater but can't be directly attributed is the amount of market cap that will be lost by every Indian company because of the stench this creates around all Indian companies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, some of the criticisms that Hindenburg has leveled against this company, um, one of the main things is this idea of promoter holdings disclosures. And what they're referring to with that rule is, it's a rule for India's stock market, that basically 25% of the float of a public company needs to be held by non-promoters or, you know, non-insiders, people who aren't affiliated with the company. And what Hindenburg found is that with all of these Adani subsidiary companies, by the way, there are seven publicly listed subsidiary companies beneath Adani Group. With all of those companies, the share of ownership held by Adani's insiders is almost exactly 75%. And that's publicly disclosed. But beyond that, Hindenburg found several offshore companies that own 10% more shares. And Hindenburg believes that all of those accounts are directly tied to Adani's insiders. The reason they think that is because those funds portfolios have a roughly 99% concentration in Adani Group shares. So, you know, if that's true, then this is a public company. It's the largest in India, which is 85% owned by one group. And in this case, that's the Adani family, which to me just screams fraud. Have you ever seen a fraud like this before? Well, there was Enron. I mean, FTX was was trying to support or, I mean, this, this all kind of comes down to this notion of wash trading or figuring out a way to send fake signals such that the marketplace begins to believe an illusory, unreal, inflated value of the shares you own that you can then sell. Mm -hmm. So, and you brought this to my attention, I was just blown away that something like 50% of all trading in NFTs last year was WASH trading. And that was multiple mm -hmm. wallets controlled by the same person trading NFTs back and forth for higher prices to create the illusion that something is worth X when it's really worth like 0.1X, hoping that someone steps in and buys it for X, thinking, well, a third party values it at X. Maybe it is worth X. Right. This sounds like more of that. Tasty. It sounds like these offshore groups that are linked and have a vested interest or are controlled by existing shareholders or current shareholders were trying to manipulate the stock without disclosing who they were and yeah. such that the value of these shares would go up and then they could sell at an opportune moment. Uh, this is fraud. And this is why we need regulators and we need transparency and we need disclosures. Uh, but this is, you know, you saw this at FTX where they would create all sorts of entities to try and prop up the value of their coin and then, you know, ultimately over time, you create Jenga here. You create a house of cards. And when one, you know, one of these wooden blocks gets pulled out, whether it's disclosure, whether it's the value of the coin going down, whatever it might be, or a regulator stepping in, the whole thing collapses. Yeah. Uh, Enron was accused of purposely making the relationship between all other companies and the, their reports so complicated that no one could figure it out. And then finally, when a couple analysts said, okay, we're bright enough to say we could have figured it out it was if, if it could be figured out, and it can't, which means that this is bullshit and this is fraud. And the whole thing went down and a bunch of them ended up in jail. Yeah. So this feels very, like you said, I wouldn't use the word mafia, um, right. although it sounds like some of the techniques around trying to intimidate the press felt mafia-like. Um, I would say that it's more, you know, more kind of standard fraud yeah. or market manipulation. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, it feels like this has just been the theme of the past year, which is like when you don't have regulation, 
you can just pump up stock prices irrationally. And here are the numbers. This is crazy. So Adani Enterprises, that's sort of the main subsidiary group that deals with coal, they had a price to earnings ratio of 508. And the industry average in India is 12. Adani Total Gas, that was trading at 831 times earnings. The industry average is 20. And Adani Transmission traded at 312 times earnings. I mean, yeah, it's exactly the, what you're describing, which is just these crazy irrational valuations um, that, yeah, it looks like it's just purely a function of people owning too much of the float and then having the ability to engineer the supply and demand. Yeah, this is, this is um, uh, like I said, it's, it is the worst thing to happen to the brand that is the Indian stock market. Between 2011 mm-hmm. and 2020, the main Indian index, the Sensex, returned a CAGR of 9.7%, while the Dow Jones Industrial returned a CAGR of 975 So the Indian market or the Sensex and the Dow have sort of been a parody. In 2022, however, the Sensex increased 3%, while the Dow Jones Industrial Average decreased 3%. The Indian stock market is worth approximately 3.4 trillion, much less than the 10 trillion the mainland China stock market, or 40 trillion for the U.S. Uh, but Indian stocks are relatively expensive right now. The average P of 22 versus 10 in China and seven in Brazil. India's main central bank is also hesitant to open up its markets and economy fully because it wants to maintain the rupee's value against the dollar. This all just feels like a house of cards. And at some yeah. point, it'll be a buying opportunity because the, the pendulum is very rarely at the very bottom. Yeah. But this feels like the beginning of a pretty serious correction. And it feels to me like, Adani, you said is down 40%. Is that right? Uh, yeah, 50%. It's hard to imagine that it doesn't go down more. And a right. lot of this is probably that they're sending that same bullshit instruction to their offshore accounts to try and, you know, to try and support the stock. And at some point they'll run out of firepower. At some point, yeah. you know, they'll have to start selling to cover, you know, my guess is they margined up to try and support the stock and keep buying. And at some point they're gonna exactly. get, if the stock keeps coming down, they're gonna get margin calls. And then when they start selling, I mean, the thing is really gonna crater. So. down, I still say, look out below. Yeah. Yeah, you you mentioned that that they're on margin. This is exactly what Hindenburg is accusing them of. They investigated the promoters, so that is the insiders' holdings and the percentage of those holdings that have been pledged as collateral. Um, So for a Donnie Power, uh, roughly a quarter of insiders' holdings have been pledged for loans. Um, At a Donnie Ports, that number is 17%. At Adani Enterprises, that number is 3%. Hindenburg, their thesis is they're way over leveraged. Um, When the stock comes down, they're screwed. I'm wondering those numbers specifically, you know, a quarter of your holdings, is that, does that spell real danger for a margin call event? If a person, if an individual is pledging, you know, a fifth of their holdings, is that, number abnormally high in your experience? So there's an algorithm that every financial institution calculates every day around what is uh, the appropriate level of margin. And it comes down to a bunch of things, including the concentration risk. If you only own one stock, they don't like that. If it's a stock that's trading less than like 10 bucks, they don't like that either. They want, you know, they want, they do an algorithm every day to make sure that, okay, with a massive move in the market, the money they owed you or the money you've borrowed against that stock always gets repaid, that if worse comes to worse, they could liquidate that position and get the money back that they have lent you against that that stock as security. So for example, with Elon Musk, I imagine he only gets 25 or 35% margin power. It might be mm-hmm. more, but if he owns $100 billion in Tesla stock, they're like, look, boss, this thing is could go down 90%, and it's one stock. We don't like that lack of diversification, so we'll let you borrow 25 or $30 billion against this $100 billion. Mm-hmm. But we don't want to lend you more because if we wake up one day and in a week it's off 60 or 70 percent, we're not sure you're going to have – you're going to own stock that's worth just what you owe us. And if it goes below that, we're all in a world of hurt and no CEO of an investment bank wants to get on an earnings call and say, we lent this guy too much money and he couldn't pay us back. Mm-hmm. Having said that, there's a lot of moving parts here. My guess is that Donnie has a lot of political connections, can put a lot of pressure on banks to maintain their margin um, – complexion and yeah. probably a lot of these banks might even be in bed with them and not want to see a run on the stock. So there's probably a lot of parties that have a lot at stake here. 
uh, if there's corruption here, it's why wouldn't there be corruption across our lending institutions? Mm. I think the biggest risk at this point is I got to think that the Indian government and regulators, unless they're infected by this corruption and there's some hints of that, have got to restore faith in the market and swoop in and may make an example of these guys. Right. Um, I think they're all sort of hoping that, that we just hold on and it slowly corrects or just stop, we stop the hemorrhaging. But the numbers you pointed out are just so extraordinary yeah. that I think at some point the government goes, okay, we got the markets in the world, the global investment world wants a blood offering and the blood offering is gonna be a Donnie. But it comes down to how powerful they are, how politically connected they are. And I bet that they have a lot of very powerful people in places who have a vested interest in making sure that Adani and this group does not go down. But I think the market is bigger than any one company. I just don't, um, this feels, let me put it this way. I, I, I think the story is just getting started here. Thanks, Scott. Let's take a look at the week ahead. We'll see the trade deficit and wholesale inventories from December, and the US Treasury will release its monthly income statement for January. This usually doesn't get much attention, but with the debt ceiling looming as a political fight, that's probably about to change. We've also got earnings from Disney, Uber, Lyft, CVS, Activision, Blizzard, Robinhood, and your favorite, Scott, Chipotle. Uh, do you have any predictions for us? It just feels, um, so my prediction is this is the recession that never materializes. And, um, you know, I've been saying it's coming. I'm a catastrophist or a pessimist at heart. But I'm holding on to this notion that whenever you worry about something for so long, it just doesn't happen. And we've been talking about a recession for since the beginning of the pandemic. And we stopped the stimulus. We did have the eighth worst uh, year in history in the S&P. Uh, but my sense is we have, on a lot of levels, a pretty strong economy right now. And even in the tech sector where there's layoffs, it's going to result in a massive increase in, in shareholder value. It appears as if the markets have new mojo right now. So I hate to feel this way. I never like to be a bull, but it just, I would say that my sentiment right now is more bullish than it's been in a long time. And I think you're going to see these tech stocks continue to rip because I think people are going to go between the threat of AI reducing the wage leverage that employees have between the number of people they're going to lay off and between an economy that still continues to do pretty well. By the end of this year, you're going to see record earnings across the tech sector. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm very bullish on the growth part of our economy right now. That's all for this episode. Our producers are Claire Miller and Jason Staver. Special thanks to Catherine Dillon, Ed Elson, Mia Silverio, and the Property Media team. If you like what you heard, please follow, download, and subscribe. Thank you for listening to Property Markets from the Vox Media Podcast Network. Join us on Wednesday for Office Hours, and we'll be back with a Fresh Markets episode every Monday. That's right, Office Hours on Wednesday and Markets on Monday. 